everybody. Uh, super excited to be closing out uh, lead the inaugural Lead Dev Live here, and I'm very privileged to be joined by uh, such awesome people. I know Mary's given us a quick intro, but I'm going to ask you, uh, we'll go clockwise. I'm going to ask you to each give uh, a little bit more info about yourselves. I'll go first. Uh, as Mary said, my name is Kevin Goldsmith. I'm the CTO at Onfido, or actually Onfido. Mary, you made me pronounce my own company wrong. Um, we're based, uh, I'm based in London, but I spent, uh, as Mary said, I spend part of my time in Seattle. I am calling to you from Seattle right now. Uh, I, uh, I, as, a, as CTO, uh, just talking about how vision enters into my role, uh, I'm responsible for setting technical vision for my company over the next, you know, uh, foreseeable future. Uh, my team is split across multiple geographies, uh, big team in London, big team in Lisbon, but we're also in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Evera, Paris, uh, uh, Singapore, San Francisco. So that's a, an important part of how I have to communicate my vision uh, as well. So I wanted to ask each of the panelists, what is the first thing you're going to do when we get back to some sort of level of normalcy? I, uh, I'm going to cheat on my own question. I have a Seattle thing and a London thing. In Seattle, I'm going to uh, take my daughter to the bookstore we always go to on the island we live on. Uh, that's like our weekend thing. I'm going to go and do that and actually get to do that live. Uh, when, we, when I get back to London, I'm going to go visit my local. They have the best pie mash in London. OK, I'm going to hand it over to you, Laurent. Uh, to introduce yourself a little bit more. Cool, thanks, Kevin. You're uh, you're making me hungry. Okay, so uh, I am Lawrence <laughs> Brimiller, calling in from the beautiful hills of Oakland, California. I'm currently the CTO of Optimizely, where I run our overall engineering technology effort and also lead our strategy. Uh, for some context, we come from a heritage of like selling our software to marketers, but really focusing on our kind of new full stack products marketed towards engineers. And so our vision is really evolving. So actually setting and clarifying this vision is an especially big part of my job right now. Um, so as far as the, when we get back to normalcy, I'm not really sure how normal things are gonna be once we all stop quarantining. I actually think they're gonna be different and interesting and unexpected ways. But if I had to pick one thing, uh, one of the first things I'll be looking for is seeing live music. Uh, I've done some of the streaming and it's cool. I'm glad people are doing that, but I'm really looking forward to getting back in a crowded venue with great energy and seeing some, uh, seeing a good show. Maria? That sounds great. Actually, I'm quite jealous. I think I should choose that one as well. Uh, uh, my name is Maria Gutierrez. Uh, I am originally from Barcelona, but I'm calling from very near Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, where I've lived for the last 20 years. I do, however, uh, regularly commute to London for work. Uh, I haven't done that for a while now, as you can imagine. Uh, I've swapped commuting for homeschooling of a nine-year-old, so that's proven uh, challenging. Um, I am Senior Director of Engineering Engineering at Intercom, and I'm also co-site lead for our London office. Uh, and aside from the London side responsibilities, uh, I lead our product engineering teams in London and lead how we evolve our all-wide engineering growth and recognition programs and also manage our R&D operations, which is a new focus area for us, uh, responsible for improving and evolving our product and engineering functions, uh, operational excellence, and leadership cohesion. Uh, I have been a software engineer for about 20 years. Uh, the last seven years, I have been in senior leadership positions at different companies as director or VP of engineering. And during that time, I've been involved in helping define company or product and engineering vision and strategy and helping my teams execute against those goals. Um, I'm extremely passionate about aligning engineering uh, with the product and company goals. I'm really excited to talk about that with all of you. Um, and although I would choose kind of live music as one of the things I'm going to do, I think I don't have a choice on what's going to happen once all of this settles. Uh, my little boy's birthday is in a few days, uh, in a few weeks, uh, and he's very, very concerned that he can have a party with his friends. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that the moment all of this settles, uh, we will be throwing a big birthday bash for him. So uh, I think there's no choice in the matter. Okay, and, and Neha. Uh, hi, so my name is Neha and I'm calling in from San Francisco. 
and uh, I work for GitHub. So I'm the senior engineering manager there and I work on two products alongside with, um, well, I help lead it with my product manager and my designer. And so we work on GitHub desktop and we work on GitHub CLI. And so I'm kind of here on this panel to represent that um, not all people, but my own opinions as someone who manages um, individual contributors, um, engineers directly. And um, I kind of draw from that experience and being a, a consultant a long time ago where I worked through change management and um, kind of helping other utilities uh, developing their own visions. And finally, um, with Rights Be Code, which is an, a nonprofit, um, I was on the board for that. And we, I managed a bunch of different uh, chapters across the US um, and helped them kind of create their own visions and see, figure out how to interpret our vision and um, allocate that to their local cities. So um, right now in the world, um, it's a lot about like figuring out how we fit into the bigger GitHub vision. And that's what I'm working on right now and continuing to evolve that. So when I go back to normalcy, um, I think one of the first things that I want to do is go to some of my favorite restaurants. Um, we have a lot of really great food here. And um, I have one that I've been going to relatively consistently. And people actually know my face, which is really exciting. I'm in a big city. And so I'm hoping to go back and say hi. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Let's uh, let's dive in um, to talking about our, our core subject. To start off, um, I have a, just a just a sort of expectation or definition question. So, um, let's start with you, Maria. Um, what does vision look like in your role, or how do you define vision? For me, a vision is about our ability as, as leaders to define and communicate, as importantly, a, a compelling view of the world, whether how things are going to look for us maybe in two to five years. It depends what you're shooting for. Uh, and that, with that, what we're trying to do is push us forwards towards ultimately the mission uh, of the company uh, and clearly state uh, different aspects of our work. Uh, at Intercom, we have a, a very interesting framework I haven't used before, but actually really resonates with me. We call it the three P's. Uh, and that summarizes it to me very nicely. So when we talk about the three P's, we talk about people, our product, uh, and our profit. So it's trying to explain to the company or to your part of the organization, where do we want to be from a people point of view? What's the evolution of the organization going to look like? How our products and services should look like? What are we trying to build? Uh, what problems are we trying to solve for our customers? And what difference are we going to make for them in that timeline? And ultimately, kind of the profit or the impact that we will have in the health of the business if we kind of achieve those things. So what are the outcomes? that we're shooting for. I think with that clarified, then you're really ready to set a strategy that will help you execute on, on that vision. So uh, one, I, I like that idea that you actually have business outcomes as part of your, your framework, which is really, I think, really mm -hmm. helps establish sort of what's, what's going on. Um, just to follow up on that, because you also mentioned strategy. Now there's a correlation or there's a, a relationship from vision to strategy. Um, and and into then sort of roadmaps. Um, can you talk uh, from your perspective? And, and I have something I'd like to add on this as well because I think about this a lot. But from your perspective, Maria, where does that where does vision lead to strategy? Lead to roadmaps? I think there's always three three things that we talk about. We talk about mission, we talk about vision, and we talk about a strategy. And sometimes it's very easy to mix it all up. Uh, I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni. If you've ever heard me talk about this, uh, you know that I always have examples uh, of what he talks about. But he kind of tries one way that he defines those things, and it really resonates with me and how we see it uh, as well at Intercom, is that mission is the why. Is why do we exist as a business? What is ultimately that we're trying? to change in the world and uh, that will make it better hopefully and it's pretty settled it's pretty stable it should not change and even if things the context changes a little bit you're still going for that a specific reason that was why we created the business and that provides the purpose for all our kind of employees to really get bought in into what we're trying to do then when you move it when you move into the vision that's maybe a little bit more short 
term and is a description of the where. Where are we going uh, towards that? Why and where do we want to be in a specific period of time? Uh, and that might be very different for different companies depending on what state uh, of their kind of uh, life cycle they are. Like it's very different where to what you might be shooting for in two to three years if you are a startup in a specific domain that another company that is very established and maybe is trying to IPO or kind of have other different types of goals for the long term. The strategy is then we've got the why, we've got the where, and now it's like, how are we going to get there? What are the tough decisions that we're going to make that help us really kind of get to that place that we're going for? And is kind of, what are we going to focus on to reach uh, that vision? Uh, is there a very specific target customer and very specific problems that they have that we think will help us uh, to get closer to that vision? Uh, and strategy is all about making tough decisions really provide focus and clear guidance on how we are going to execute. Once you have that strategy, then teams can then take that on and really start figuring out what those milestones and goals are and the roadmaps that they need to focus on to be able to deliver incrementally towards that strategy and the vision. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. No, that's great. I think that's a, that's a great sort of context setting. I think I like to use an analogy with my team, which is for one, um, a vision might be, this is what good looks like to me. Like we are, we're doing what we are now and we're doing pretty well, but what would really awesome look like in our day to day? Like for, uh, for our engineering and research and IT teams and, and at Onfido, what would a better, like, what's a better world that we could all be living in that would make it easier for our, us to do our jobs, bring value to customers, all that kind of thing, and setting that context for them. But then what I use would be, if you use the analogy like you're an explorer and you're on top of a mountain and you see the next mountaintop, the vision is sort of let's get to that mountaintop. That's going to be a better place to be, a taller mountain, more trees, whatever. Now there's a valley in between them. So your strategy is going to be, well, we're, we're trying to get to that mountaintop, but right now we just need to get down the mountain we're on. So that's a much shorter context. And along the way, you're going to have, you're going to encounter different things. You're going to change things, but you kind of know where you're going. And so that's sort of strategy and milestones and plans on that short term with that goal of that final goal. Um, Laurent, uh, I, I think you have something to add into this as well. Yeah, no, I just really wanted to second the whole uh, you know, notion of the mission really being about the why and the vision being about the where, and then the strategy being about the how. But the, the thing I would yeah. add there would be, um, I feel like the vision, mission as well, but especially the vision, I think it really serves to inspire. And whenever you're writing these things and rolling them out and communicating them, you always have to be thinking about, well, why am I, why am I doing this? Why am I you know, thinking about this every day? Uh, and the more of its strategy and you know, goals, the more it's tying to day-to-day -day work, and I really think that when you're putting together a vision, you also have to say, you know, is someone, me or someone else on my team, going to get out of bed fired up because of this vision that we set? So always put that litmus test uh, on whatever you're coming up with. There's a there's a piece about empowerment there too, which is that if you if everyone understands the vision and you want them to make good decisions in their teams, if they kind of know where they should where they're going, they can make much better decisions. Um, Neha, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this question. Um, so you know, in your role, right? You you have both. You have these sort of dual roles as a board member of a nonprofit, and then also as an engineering manager. Do you have a process like for setting vision or working with the board to create a vision or working with your team? Do you have a process or a set of hacks for for the vision uh, for your team for creating that vision? Yeah, I would say that um, it really depends on like which position I'm in. So sometimes if I'm like at the board level, that's a little bit higher. And so my job is to create something and ensure that this is something that we're all aligned on. This is something that we're on board with. And this is something that does inspire us, kind of like what Lawrence, Lawrence said. And like from uh, my job perspective, I'm also trying to look at an existing vision and figure out, OK, um, given like what my products are capable of, given like what we want to do and where we want to go, how do we align with that vision? And so we're responding to a vision, but we're also creating a vision at our own level as well. And sometimes, depending on that vision is, you might be able to inspire upward. 
So I'm holding these two sides where we have our upward side and our downward side. And one of the hacks that I like to do is I like to, well, I don't know if I would call it a hack, but um, I, one of the things that I really like to do is to ensure that we're still aligned. So things are always moving, things are always changing. And um, it's good to periodically revisit what is this vision? Does this still make sense to us? Does it still resonate with us? And also to reach out to our stakeholders, right? Does this vision still make sense for the business, right? When we're talking about profits, um, we're in, uh, like my products are in an interesting situation where GitHub Desktop and CLI are both free, right? So how does that work with respect to products? How do we better define this? And it causes us to be a little bit more creative and try to understand how we fit in, um, which I enjoy the challenge, it's fun. I like that point about coming back and, and checking back in on uh, on sort of your 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 vision and revisiting it as uh, because the situations change. Uh, so, is there a way that um, uh, I'm going to throw it back to to Lawrence actually? So, when uh, when do you change strategy and vision? You were coming back visiting it. Um, when do you make a decision to to make a change? And and how, how do you uh, what? what, what uh, precipitates that change usually? Yeah, so for me, um, as much as possible, I want a vision you know, or an, even a strategy to not be something that feels such like a, like a big bang and that we, you know, once a year, we all huddle up and we write it and we unveil it and then we don't touch it. Uh, I feel like it has to be as much as possible like a living, breathing thing. And so, um, you know, the times I've seen it to be most successful, it's actually, it's maybe even one of my hacks is to have it be a living document that actually you have as many people in as you can and you use, you know, the beauty of Google Docs and whatnot to actually have it be feel like it's always changing. And then uh, to Neha's point, you know, in any for all kind of leadership communication, whether it's an all hands or a, a blog post or you know, a one on one, always trying to tie things that you see back to the vision, because I feel like as leaders, we are um, we think about this stuff all the time and it's easy for us to forget that a lot of the teams that we're trying to communicate the vision to, you know, have like very, very busy day-to-day -day jobs and hear this stuff once in a while and they need more repetition and they need us to basically tie things in like, oh, you know that thing that just shipped? Here's why that matters relative to our strategy. And just remind people, even though to us it might feel like we're just repeating ourselves all the time. Um, so again, to answer your question, I feel like we, you want to be as agile as possible and kind of have it be more interactive and then just have some sort of checkpoint maybe quarterly or probably twice a year is what I've tended to, where you just check yourself and make sure you haven't uh, kind of built up vision debt, if you will. All right, the, so I was, I was originally going to react kind of like, uh, I don't know about changing vision that often, but then when you put in that checkpoint time, like, oh yeah, right, twice a year, all right, that seems once a year, twice a year, that seems <laughs> totally reasonable. I would say like, if you're changing, if you find that you're changing your vision a lot, like multiple times a year, that's going to be really hard for your team to adjust to, right? Like that should be changing. You want to be agile, but I want to be more in my teams. I'm be way more agile on strategy, and I want to be setting a vision that things changing is probably not going to change that often, right? Um, one thing though, uh, so you know, obviously, pandemic, the the whole pandemic for our business, in particular, because we do ID verifications um, online which has now become, with the quarantine and everything, has become super, super critical. And all of a sudden we have, like, uh, our business is changing very, very quickly. So we are changing, like I am in this place of changing uh, vision just to take advantage of sort of business realities and how do we do things better. Uh, so Maria, on your side, uh, obviously Intercom is doing, like Intercom's business probably is in a very similar situation right now. Uh, how do, is your vision changing because of what's going on or how, when do you look at and change your vision? Not necessarily the vision. I mean, those are conversations that, that we're having uh, actively as we start really understanding kind of what is the impact that, that is happening in the business and really reevaluating all the assumptions that we've made uh, over the last year or so about where we wanted to take the business. So obviously nobody was putting into the mix a, pan a global pandemic. So there's now a lot of things that we need to reconsider. Um, and I think that brings a point, like what, we, what we're going through is pretty extraordinary. 
ordinary, but uh, you always need to be in a position uh, that even though I agree with you completely, I think the vision is a little bit more set. So like if you're changing it often, I think like the overhead for the company is super, super high because there's implications in organizational shape, like hiring, like, you know, the focus of people. So you ideally have quite a clear idea of where you're going, but you always need to be looking at how the market is evolving, kind of how people are using your product, what things are changing, changing and what assumptions you made that maybe in the new, you know, little by little you learn that they are not as accurate, you're learning new things. You, sh you should be in a position that you can be fine tuning that strategy kind of continuously based on what you're putting in front of customers and what is coming back from you. Uh, and I think that leads to another thing, like it's, it's one of the dangerous things uh, with a vision on a strategy is that you might end up, if it's very settled, it's very clear, it's, it's kind of, you know, set on a stone, you might create a very kind of a strict organization. It's like, no, we're committed to do those things and that's what we're gonna do and that's what we prepare for. I think you always still need to make sure that you have an adaptable organization that are really learning continuously from what's happening with your product, what's happening with your customers, what kind of context they're living in, and that you adapt to that. And this is a perfect situation. In our case, obviously, Intercom is a great tool uh, for customer services team or sales teams that now are having to work from home. So we, it's, it's like a, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool that is, is helping out with that. But obviously, kind of some of our customers could have kind of different challenges. So we need to make sure that hey, do we, what are the things that we continue working on because they're actually more valid and important than ever that we get that right to help our customers. But there's other things that maybe we wanted to push forward that we should be using our time in doing something differently uh, just given the circumstances. So my big feedback here is like, don't lose sight of what's happening uh, all the time with your product and the market uh, because if you don't adapt, you die. You know, it's the uh, evolution theory of evolution if you don't adapt you are out of the game yeah. awesome thank you um so one thing uh, i've raised i'm kind of watching for questions that are coming up in slack as well and one of the questions that came up was one thing that we were going to talk about i'm going to push it up a little bit uh we're 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 really lucky because we have folks at uh different levels of organization here we have and so one of the things we're looking at vision at kind of different levels, but also how we align people around that vision is going to be different given our, our different roles. So I'm going to start with you, Neha, if that's good. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how you align your team in your GitHub context. How do you align your team around your vision for them and, and get them all um, sort of on board with it? Yeah, I think that, um because we've had these conversations for several years now, it gets a lot easier over time um, because it's not the first time we've had this conversation. But when I first joined the team, it was really about like saying, what, what do you know about the vision so far? Um, and what of those parts really make sense for us right now? And so once we were able to kind of start a little bit bottom up, right, collaborate, understand kind of what it has been in the past, um, that allows us to be like, we have a shared like, language, we have a shared understanding of like what we really value about the product. And then we can start talking about how we're going to align forward, right? What is going on with the business and um, what parts of that, like what part do we want to have in like that overall company vision? So for us, I think getting aligned is like really, it's really important to make sure that we're on the same page. And it doesn't, it, when I say aligned, it doesn't mean that we all have the exact same opinions. It's really about understanding each other, understanding where people come from. And knowing that like we we understand all of those perspectives, especially given like the history of the product. Um, so I would say uh, I've done that really effectively. So I'm in a company that's like very remote, right? Um, right now it's 100% remote, but usually it's at least 70% remote. And so um, for conversations like this, I really like to have good facilitation techniques ready. We do this in person sometimes. So we've done it at a mini summit where we got, kind of all gotten together, gotten to go into a room and really like find ways to get us to collaborate and get our creative juices going. Cool. And then that's great. And then Maria, so you're now, so you're you in the director role. So you were managing, you're responsible for multiple teams. How does that look like? Uh, how do you align those teams onto your vision? 
it, there's different aspects. I mean, one of them is, is the first and basic one is to make sure that they fully understand it, what it is that we're trying to do. Hopefully, whatever vision we've come with, they have had a part to play. So there's already a, a buy-in. Um, but then you need to just make sure that you are now really understanding what the customers need uh, and what we're trying to achieve, achieve and the outcomes that we are agreeing. And that then kind of we reflect on our roadmaps for each team kind of how that ties uh, to, to that strategy and that vision. Um, we have multiple inputs that go into roadmaps and one very clear one is that a strategy kind of a pass down. It's like, what aspects of the strategy should we take into account together with the product health or a commercial kind of a levers that we're trying to push forward. Uh, and then kind of once we decide what we do, uh, what we decide to do is that we do regular check-ins every six weeks. We set goals and we review them uh, for kind of, and, and then move forward for the next period of time. And then we do weekly check-ins as well to make sure that anything that we're flagging uh, that, or that they might raise as a concern is being evaluated as well. So just having that information coming back and forward, I think is critical all the time. Cool. And then Lawrence, from the, the, the C level, um, how do you do this? Because now you're doing it on a, a much broader context, right? Yeah, I think maybe to start with is just being very, very uh, clear with my intentions to the wider team. And so not having this feel like it's a uh, you know, vision or strategy statements that kind of come out in other ways, but actually being very, very clear about, by the way, here's our, you know, as, as, as you talked about before, our vision is this and kind of repeating it and really amplifying it and making it clear that it's important to me to make sure that gets to every level of the organization. So kind of clear intention is one. I think um, dovetailing on some other points, I, th I think as an organization scales, you have to always check yourself as a leader and make sure that uh, it's actually, you know, all your communication is actually working. So how do, how do you know? Uh, I think you have to, you know, really work well with your leadership team and make sure that they're all aligned and you would all kind of say the same thing. But then you also have to go um, talk to, you know, the uh, the individual contributor on some team and uh, kind of sample the organization and see how the message is actually getting through. So I do a lot of that. I do, you know, sitting in on team meetings, I do, you know, a lot of skip one on ones or skip skips or just walk the halls back when we had halls to, to walk in and um, really just make sure that this stuff connects back. And it's all in a, you know, friendly, non-confrontational way, but it's all kind of this uh, data sampling to make sure that uh, what you think yeah, what you're saying is actually what's being heard. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna flip to a question that came up uh, from uh, Slack because uh, I'll explain why in a second. So um, this was a question that came up in Slack. Why do technical vision statements seem to end up in practice as a bunch of architectural best practices and principles? And I'm asking this question in particular because I am absolutely guilty of this in my role sometimes. I have to work to not do that. Uh, who wants to uh, raise your hand? Who wants to address? I think that I've seen a lot of these. All right, Maria, you're up. I'm happy because uh, that's actually an approach that we are taking uh, on purpose uh, at, uh, in our teams in product and engineering at, at Intercom. We're very much a, a product-led organization. So the strategy that we go by is mostly the product strategy. And then we identify how the different teams, you know, have a part to play in there. And maybe they have like a vision for our data stores team or for our security team, et cetera. But we are very, very driven by that product and business strategy. What we do have is very, very uh, clear principles, engineering principles that we use to make decisions across the whole organization on how do we want to evolve uh, our systems. Uh, for example, one of our, you know, we believe that our ability to move very fast is um, a strategic advantage uh, for us as, a, as an organization. So one of our principles in engineering is to be technically conservative, uh, which means that we optimize for running less software. This is no, it's Part is a principle that is part of our strategy of how we believe as an engineering organization can really help to kind of build products and those solutions, get them to market as quickly as possible. Um, but kind of we have kind of a number of principles that we use and that really help us to make decisions from a technical strategy point of view of how we want to evolve the systems without having a very specific technical strategy for the whole of engineering. 
Um, Neha, you mentioned that you had a product peer that you worked with. Where do you two draw the line on the different parts of your team's vision? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because I think that um, the so we have we call these EPD squads, right? So it's the engineering, the product, and the design lead, and we work together. I do think that like our um, relationship and how we like distribute the responsibilities is a little atypical, but it works really well for the team. And I think that that's important because it should reflect the needs of the team. Um, so I think normally you might see that like product defines the what and engineering defines the how and there's kind of like this really clear way of differentiating between the two sides. I do find um, and maybe this is like some of my experience in the past when I was working at Pivotal on like these more dynamic teams. I found that um, when you have both engineer and product in the in the room and they kind of treat each other as equals where good ideas can kind of come from anywhere um, that you end up getting a better idea of what you can do because engineers kind of like understand the underpinnings of the technology. So in a way that they, they kind of understand what's possible by the technology. And on like the product side, they're looking at like what's around us. They're looking at, they're looking at it through a different lens. And so my product manager and I, we're very, very collaborative. We, we talk very often, we ideate very often. We ideate with the team, with like the EPD side and kind of with other people in the company. Um, and so if I were to like draw, you know, like the columns and, of like the typical responsibilities and draw like how we split up, it kind of looks like this. Um, but the balance works for the team. And that's like the thing that we want to reiterate, we want to iterate on is what are the needs of the team and how can we supply those? Um, of course, we still have like some split and like having those technical discussions about how the technology can support the vision um, is something that I usually take the lead on, for example. Sure, sure. Cool. Um, Lawrence, you have anything to add there? Yeah, well, just a, a big plus on kind of the, the engineering product dynamic there. Uh, you know, I've always actually said, I said this a lot, that that uh, I expect product to really be focusing on the why and engineering to be really truly only the how, but the what is a real collaboration. And on the best teams I've worked on, that's a real, you know, it's really those groups working together and kind of pushing each other to come up with the what. Um, so an example right now is that uh, on, on where maybe a technical vision strategy is warranted versus not. Uh, so right now we are in the process of really uh, thinking about how we're going to overhaul our data infrastructure and optimize it that collects all the events from all the experiments out there. And a lot of, you know, it, it was clearly built with, you know, the products we had a few years ago. And it clearly needs to be have a, a fundamental new rev. And it's uh, it's long term enough. You know, it's something that, you know, you can make impact in three to six months, but it's going to probably be, be working on it for a couple of years. Uh, and it's core enough to our business that. Uh, oh. Do we just lose Laurent? Yeah. Oh no! All right, this is the first really time I think it's happened during the conference. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was real. Uh, I was really excited. <laughs> what are you saying? Um, all right, we're gonna wait for him to come back, and hopefully that won't be too long. Uh, uh, I I can't finish what he was saying, unfortunately. Oh, he's back. Um, oh, he's back. All right, are you back, Laurent? Sort of. No, not really. Oh, okay. Um, we're going to move on, and Lawrence will jump back in um, when when he can. Um, my, uh, I'll just very quickly. My my thing there is uh, to your point, Naya. I think when I've had a really amazing product peer, um, they can do my job. I can do their job, right? And and we'll work very much to how we talked about sort of uh, division of of focus. There, uh, but we'll also be able to very much contribute and, and support each other around that. And that's I, if you can find a product peer like that's just an amazing relationship to have. Uh, okay, Lawrence, you're back for real now. Do you want to finish up? I am back. Or... That was that was bound to happen at some point, I guess. I, I haven't watched some <laughs> other sessions to see uh, how often that's happened. Um... I haven't seen <laughs> that yet, so you're a first. No, I was just basically yeah. Okay, well, that's it's uh, the dubious honor. Um, yeah, I guess I was going to say that uh, I just think it's a judgment call as to when you find some aspect of your technology that has, has a long enough time horizon and it's core enough for your business that you really want to actually craft a vision, especially, especially around that. In our case, this data infrastructure is one, but I think it's a judgment call we all need to make. Uh, and a lot of other stuff can be handled just with a day-to-day -day interaction of product engineering. Cool. 
Um, cool. Thanks. Actually, I, uh, I, this is another question that came up from Slack that I want to see if anyone, I, I have a feeling, but I think most, all of you do as well. What exactly is your definition of vision debt? Uh, what, and what, how would you explain that to, to our audience? I'm going to go to you, Lawrence, well, I think. Well, I think I said I mean, that earlier. Really I, said that's why. <laughs> I think exactly. I think that provoked the question. So I used that term earlier. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really just talking about where, uh, you know, again, like the, the, the environment or the business or the competitive dynamic has changed and you haven't actually gone back and updated your, you know, your vision that you spent all that time on six months ago. Uh, and again, to your point earlier, it isn't like the vision that the vision vision should change all that often, but maybe to be just cross-checking and it's more likely the strategy. So maybe I really mean more strategy debt where the, the how uh, that you're approaching it might actually really change um, in three to six months time and to really go back and, and update it. And kind of my previous point was just, you know, just make it not as much of a big bang process. Like if you're always talking about this stuff, even if you don't change it that often, it won't be, you kind of demystify it a bit and it's not that big of a deal uh, if you finally decide to make a change. I um, think on, on that note, oh, uh, ahead, Marianne, I think sorry. that's one of the reasons I think it's so important. I think in the past I've seen maybe not make too much emphasis on that is how important it is that everybody in your organization is very, very aware of the business strategy and the business health and, and that the executive team and the rest of the company provide transparency. Ultimately, the people that are making decisions all the time are the engineers. And unless they have a sense of what it is that matters to the business and they're really in tune with what we're trying to achieve, they will make the wrong trade off. So they won't be pushing, you know, they won't be using their time in the best way. And if you can give them the tools and the guidelines to make those decisions autonomously, you can really kind of then give teams and individuals that agency and autonomy that they need. But for that to be possible, you really need to understand the big picture and have all that information in place. And so it feels like you have to put a lot of effort in understanding that, but then you can fly. Then you can be left, you know, a little bit on your own to make your own decisions. Absolutely. Um, the One more question from Slack and then um, we're going to wrap up here. Or wait, I'm sorry. I thought we, yeah, that's that's right. Um, so Neha, given given that you have worked uh, with nonprofit boards, there's a question that came up a bit uh, around aligning values and vision. And uh, should a vision be about how the company or organization is going to make money or is how it's going to change the world? So I think with your two different hats, you could answer that question both ways, I think, potentially. Uh, what's your opinion there? So um, there's like a few questions. I, I'm going to start with the one about like uh, vision versus values. Um, and so uh, to me, there are, um, I see values almost as like part of um, one way of like looking at strategy. So vision is kind of like where we want to go and like this big picture and values are like the things that are the most important to us when we start to make trade-offs, right? So like we always have to make these decisions and like based on our values and sometimes those values also compete with each other, right? You have to decide like, how are we going to make those trade-offs? And ultimately, how is that going to influence our strategy, how we're going to get there? So I think there's a strong relationship and it's really important to align on both vision um, and values and strategy. Um, but I see that like, I, I, I see that vision is your end point and values is like how you're going to make those decisions on, on the way. I know there are some other questions. Um, Do you want me to answer any more or you want to throw that to someone else? <laughs> no, it was just the idea of around aligning values and vision. Um, but that, but the, I think you answered that quite well. Um, Maria or Lawrence, do either of you have uh, want to weigh in? Yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with Nika. I think your values is a super important tool in your strategy uh, and what you decide to prioritize and focus it there can completely change the way you go about achieving a goal uh, and how you're going to kind of do something for your customers. You can do it in a not very nice way and achieve a great profit, or you're going to stick to your values and work a little bit harder, but achieve a result that actually potentially will be longer term and uh, more sustainable. So uh, being able to 
accommodate those values and really live them and for everybody to internalize them is as important as the vision and the mission itself. It should be something that every day we're absolutely living by and that we put in part in all the processes in place. Uh, Lawrence, anything on this or, or do we, ah, oh, he's frozen for me again. Oh, poor Lawrence. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was going to jump in right. really quickly. I have a really good short sure. story for this. So um, I actually, when we were originally on the team, we had established kind of a vision and a mission and a strategy and a roadmap, um, but we didn't have the values part of it. And so what, um, when our product manager came onto the team, that was one of the first things that they kind of wanted to make sure that we aligned on was like these values and what he noticed from like this outside perspective, which is one of the best things about brand new people who enter the team is that they notice these gaps and they can address them, um, is that we had intuited what those values were. Once we got them all on a paper, we realized that we actually had very similar values, but um, it's so important to have things that are like centrally documented that we like take the time to write them and that they're easily easy to locate. Um, and I think values is one of those great examples. Okay, we're gonna, um, we've got about five minutes left. I'm gonna uh, wrap it up with a, a final question for, for each of us. Um, we'll start with you, Lawrence, while we have you. Um, hopefully we'll have you through the <laughs> question. Yep, fingers so, crossed. Um, yeah, <laughs> so what's, uh, Given this conversation we have had, but just generally, what's the one idea you'd like the folks watching to, to take away about vision and strategy going forward? Yeah, I think I've said it already, but I'll just repeat it. I think that making it making it uh, live. I think there's there's too many times when I've seen these things be worked on in bursts and then they kind of sit on the shelf and uh, once in a while reference. So the, the, the thing that really has worked for me recently, um, the last couple of companies and especially optimizing is having this be a living document. And again, you know, it isn't like it has to change all the time or you know, the, the, you know, the details, maybe the strategy beneath the vision can change more often, but having it feel like it's a living, breathing thing that has everybody in there. Um, that would be the biggest, if, if you can think of in your own company, how you can uh, move towards that, that'd be my biggest recommendation. Cool. Uh, Maria? I, I very much align with that thinking. Like if, if a, a good vision and a strategy won't just come from you, uh, is you need to frame it always uh, around problems that you want to solve for a target audience and that really align with the values and the business mission uh, and that really leverage the people that have the knowledge, whether it is in the teams with the deep knowledge or the executives uh, that have opinions and influence from the market and investors, etc. Like if you make something that is a uh, kind of form through all the knowledge and the skills that you have in the company, you will always have something way, way more stronger and directly with a buy-in that you need to make it a, a reality and to really execute on it. So uh, involve as many people as, as you can uh, to make sure you nail it. Great. Uh, Neha, your final thoughts here? Yeah, um, I kind of wanted to talk to um, the managers out there um, and we, just, we talked a lot about like interpreting and kind of like setting for your team, but I wanted to talk about the opposite direction, which is influencing upward, right? And so I truly believe that managers and um, and engineers and anyone who's working like on um, the lower part of the organizational structure, you're the subject matter experts, right? You get to see things happening on a daily basis. You understand the problems that are upcoming and you have this ability to kind of help the people who are um, higher up and who are establishing these visions understand what you're seeing. And so I just think it's really valuable to um, establish those communication networks, figure out who those stakeholders are, what they want to hear about, um, and understanding your strategic, like where you can add value to that um, because you have kind of lived in this world. And um, yeah, I just like strongly recommend you to share it upward. And sometimes that means like seeing if you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with a VP. Sometimes that means um, asking to be added to a document. Um, but I really want you to trust your gut and know that there's always a constructive way to kind of approach that. And and to and from my perspective, speaking as a CTO, I absolutely love to see that. I love seeing that in the leads and from the leads in my organization. So um, we're we're at time here, and I I just want to thank uh, 
the lead dev and White October and uh, White Coat Captioning and everyone that's helped make this conference, uh, this first virtual lead dev conference so great. I've been watching both days. I've learned a lot. I've, I love the Slack. Thanks, everyone. We're going to um, be answering questions uh, immediately after this. So uh, feel free. I know we couldn't answer everyone's questions. We'll, we'll be around to answer them in real time. All right. Thanks, everyone.